Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me in the locker room on this Thursday, December 22nd. I'm Alan Locker. Today, you will meet cast members, writers, and directors of some of the award-winning films, including Jimmy and Carolyn, Carolyn, Unidentified Objects, and Boyfriend. You will also meet one of the stars of the Italian submission, The Neighbor. All of these films were featured at, 20, at the Out at the Movies International Film Festival in September of this year. Out at the Movies Winston-Salem, North Carolina's LGBTQIA Plus Film Series was co-founded in August of 2004 by my first guest today, Rex Welton. Stay tuned to learn about these award-winning films, but first, please welcome to the locker room the co-founder of Out at the Movies International Film Festival, Mr. Rex Welton. Hello, hey, Rex. Ryan. How are you? I'm well. Good to see you. Happy Hanukkah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, also for including me uh, for the second time as a juror at this year's festival. It was uh, really fun to be there in person, but Hurricane Ian kept kept a few of the folks away, but I think it was a, a great festival. No, what did you think of uh, Well, it, it was overall a very good festival. We had to do a lot of pivoting. Thankfully, most of the folks there, the audience members, the celebrities, even the jurors didn't realize how chaotic it was behind the scenes. But, you know, we had our opening night, as you remember, we had close to 70 mile per hour winds and our <laughs> original location for our opening night film, Jimmy and Carolyn, closed down for 24 hours. So we had to pivot to a downtown Winston-Salem theater, but uh, it all it, it all worked really, really well. So, and that's only the second hurricane we've had to deal with in, in, in nine years. In fact, one of your later guests, Gregory Harrison, was here with his film about five years ago. We also had the uh, remnants of a hurricane, so. <laughs> well, well, we hope Gregory's gonna join. I think he's uh, possibly on the set of General Hospital today. Oh, okay, so. okay. <laughs> What's the hardest part of putting a festival like this together, Rex? Uh, honestly, probably raising the money. Um, it, people don't realize how much money it takes to put on any kind of artistic event. In our case, we pay, we don't pay any appearance fees. All the actors, directors, producers that join us, join us for free. However, we do pay for them to fly to Winston-Salem and to stay in Winston-Salem. So fundraising is a challenge, you know, also probably the biggest challenge now for film festivals. And this is out at the movies, probably Sundance, probably any film festival you can think of, is getting a younger demographic involved in the process because there's so many ways now there to, to consume film that it, it's hard to get younger folks. So that's really going to be a focus of 2023 for us. How can we reach the younger demographic? And um, that's, that's great. Tell us about the Emerging Artist Filmmaker Grant Competition. Sure. So we started that. This was the inaugural year and we had three winners. We had 15 submissions from all over the world and folks basically submitted an outline of a, of a film project they wanted to do. We had a committee of jurors that selected the top three and we awarded them monies to be used to actually make that film. And our hope is, is that they're going to premiere their film at our 2023 festival. If they're not going to premiere it, they'll at least show it there. So we're really excited to be able to help emerging filmmakers um, make movies. That's awesome. When do you start taking submissions for the 2023 festival? Uh, February 1st on, on Film Freeway. We, we will we'll believe February 1st and we'll probably get submissions up until about the beginning of July. And then we'll have our, our slate for 23 in, in late July and get ready for another festival. And people can... Uh, go to the website for more information. That's right. Out at the movies.org. Yep. You got it up. And, uh, and again, we take our submissions through film freeway. Some people aren't familiar with film freeway. And if they wanted to actually send us a link and a password of a film to our out at the movies email address, that would be fine as well. Okay, great. And, and can you tell us before I let you go about the university of North Carolina school of the arts scholarship? Sure. So their their school of filmmaking has been our headquarters and our home for the last uh, 17 or 18 years. And about five or six years ago, we started presenting an annual out at the movie scholarship to a student in the school of filmmaking. He, she or they are doing really well in school, but they need some financial help. So the dean of the school actually selects the recipient and we provide the scholarship money, which um, is very helpful to them. And it's also a wonderful thing that we're able to do. We, this out of the movies is all about giving back to the community. We're a 501c3 not-for-profit. We don't have any paid staff. So we just want to put on a good show. 
you you certainly do that and i know um my next guests will will uh back me up on saying so do you have dates for uh 2023 yes so we're it's going to be late september or early october we're actually waiting on a couple of the local universities to publish their homecoming dates because when there's a homecoming football game in town hotel rooms downtown are very scarce and so we're we're going to schedule outside of the homecoming games. So we'll probably have a um, date on our website by the middle of the spring. Awesome. Rex, thank you again for including me. It was a joy to be there. Alan, thank you so much for doing this and happy Hanukkah and happy holidays. Same to you. Say hello to Brad. I sure will. Bye. Bye. All right, everybody, let's get started. So... Thank you to Rex for being here. James Andrew Walsh won the Jury Award at the Festival for Best Screenplay for his film, Jimmy and Caroline. And Tony nominee, stage and TV star, Mary Beth Peel, won the Jury Award for Best Supporting Actress. Jimmy and Caroline stars Gregory Harrison as Jimmy Walker, a retired auto body repairman recently diagnosed with cancer, alongside Mary Beth, who plays his wife, Caroline. This family comedy drama examines the struggles of a lo long-term gay relationship within the framework of the traditional American family. On a whim to celebrate Jimmy's 75th birthday, Jimmy and Carolyn decide to drive from Florida to Westerly, Rhode Island to surprise their son, James, and his partner, William. The bigger surprise awaits them is the emotional crisis threatening to destroy James and William's 20-year relationship. Returning home to New England triggers painful memories and crushing regrets for Jimmy and Carolyn, revealing darker truths as all four struggles with the past and now or never choices they face. Joining James and Mary Beth today are Gregory Harrison, Mark Dold, Albert, Alberto Bonilla, along with executive producer Kimberly Chesser. Please welcome them all to the locker room. Hi, we're all. <laughs> You're all here except Mark. I don't know where Mark is. Hey. Thank this is you amazing. All. Thank oh you all God, so much amazing. for being here. And congratulations, James and Mary Beth. James, I wanted to start. You and I shared the car back from the airport when we arrived in Winston-Salem. And you told me right away that you loved Out at the Movies Film Festival. Would you please tell everybody why? Well, I think because, first of all, thanks for having us, Alan. And it was so, so nice awesome. meeting you at the festival. Um, I think first and foremost, hospitality is one of the things that often is overlooked at some of the festivals. And hospitality is sort of, you know, essential in terms of you journey to a place, you get there, whether it's COVID and masking, whatever, and you get there. And to be in the company of other filmmakers and to feel like the folks running the festival not only have the integrity uh, artistically, but also the sort of goal and community uh, uh, join uh, join in or community uh, engagement to really put on a first class festival and, and kind of wine you and dine you and have parties and really care that you have a great time. And as 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 insignificant as that sounds, having a great time is <laughs> I, I, that's kind of in the word festival, you know. So, and also I, I think they really love movies. And of course, being at the North Carolina School of the Arts is thrilling it's such a beautiful hi mark it's such a beautiful place to be and you know it's like the back lot of paramount it's it's beautiful so it's our favorite festival it, it really is we love that festival mm -hmm. well, that's awesome thank you for sharing that mark you're on mute but mary beth and gregory as parents and and um i'm always really that. playing james's parents in this film <laughs> um Talk about reading the script for the first time and your thoughts when you first read this incredible screenplay, Mary Beth. You mean when when I first read it in front of James, or when I read it in my <laughs> when, in when the you privacy first... of my boudoir? <laughs> yes, in your boudoir. <laughs> in my boudoir, I I I was engaged with the 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 characters and everything, but I I thought, well, there's no way. I, 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 that I can play this part. I mean, I, I thought I was flattered to be asked to to look at it, and um, but I didn't understand why James and Kimberly would even think that I would be right for this character. Um, 
I was engaged with the character and with the story and with all the other characters, but I just sort of was just, I just read it for the fun of it. And then when it turned out that, yes, they actually were serious about my doing it, that, that, that was thrilling because I don't think anybody else would have thought of me for this care, this part. Wow. I'm grateful. Gregory, for you? Um, well, very similar. Uh, I don't think anyone else would have thought of me for this role. And uh, so it was, I was thrilled to, to have James' belief in my ability to, to uh, portray his father. But it was a long journey with James and I. I, I did a reading of this uh, six, seven years ago with James here in L.A. And, uh, you know, I, I, a friend of ours, a mutual friend of ours, asked me to come in and read it. And, <clears throat> and I, I thought, this is really interesting. I, I, I love doing, you know, parts that I'll never get in reading. <laughs> yes. And then James... James Something I don't know what it was, James. You'll have to explain it. But it, but it was like he said, "No, you're Jimmy. You're Jimmy. This is Jimmy." And and as it progressed through the years, and then it went to, to to theatrical versions and all that, I I just kept uh, uh, being asked by James to do it. And I was fortunately I was working and busy. I wasn't available for those. But then he came back to me for the movie version, and I was available. And his belief in me and his his uh, uh, insistence on coming back to me made me do make one of the best choices I've ever made, which is to say yes and yeah. and come and do it. And uh, and and the the film itself, the script itself, the story is very compelling. But also the way we made it was very compelling. Mm. The whole experience mm. of making this film was in, was life changing for me and and uh, kind of icing on a on a long uh, uh, professional cake of mine. And this, this is a very sweet icing. And, and I loved the whole process. We, the people on this screen lived together for, for a month. Excuse me, I'm, I'm on the set of General Hospital. They're gonna come on any second. <laughs> but I'm able to drop in here. But uh, 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 the people in this, on this screen right now, um, we, we lived together, we became a, family um and and develop trust and the, the idea of rehearsing for two and a half three weeks and then shooting an entire movie in six days was first of all it sounds insane but secondly it was wonderful yeah. it was just a, it, it was exactly what i needed in my life to be able to dip into this character and do the this thing that i love and i've devoted my past 50 years to learning how to do and and sit with a bunch of people who felt the same way and who brought their own skills and talents and we just I don't know what it was it was magical it was just magical and a lot of that in spite of a lot of of uh, of resistance from the weather and other things budget weather we we it, some of the magic came out in the movie and yeah. I, I'm very proud of it and uh, very grateful, very grateful, like Mary Beth said, to to have had this experience and to have worked with these incredible people. I love that. Gregory, if you get called to set, please say hello to Laura Wright and Maura West, who are dear friends of mine. Okay, I will. <laughs> I will. Um, they're in Mark, my story bubble today, but, they're, but I'll, I'll see them. <laughs> Mark and Alberto, um, you play James's, James and James's partner in the film. Talk about the you know the pressure maybe or uh, of playing James and his partner while James is directing. <laughs> you, <laughs> Elvis, Mark, you go first. You go first. I'm gonna leave. Uh, well, it. I, I, I actually. <laughs> I, oh, he took his glasses off. Too. <laughs> I actually, I you know I I actually had I have to echo what Gregory said. It was probably. The, one of the best, if not the greatest, filming experience I've, I've ever had because what James, number one, did, he got everybody right on the bus. Everybody on the everybody that was in our little family unit was just so open and so lovely. So um, 
and the biggest moment for me, I remember was, you know, I, I, I was nervous and stuff, but I remember James saying, you know, you can be, you can be you. I want you. I want you with the script. That's why I, and, and he gave me permission to be me, which freed me more and which allowed me to be even more funny than I was. Cause I was always in my, you know, cause when I first got there, I was, I was nervous. It was, you know, everybody was so good. You know, you get that you show up on set and you know, you're like, okay, well, how's your, and everybody's like, Oh my God. I gotta see with Mary Beth Peel. Fuck, how am I gonna do this? <laughs> <laughs> but um, but that was for me. That was the thing was was giving permission to really bring myself, and um, but it's it's written so tight. It was just written so tight that I it was like I just had to show up and just be honest. And when I was able to do that, every everybody was just on fire. It was there, there were times where we do takes and and I wouldn't know if we had gotten it or not because I just didn't remember and. James would have like tears in his eyes. It was great. So uh, that was my experience. Mark? I think naively, uh, I, it didn't dawn on me that I was playing the executive producer, writer, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Phil, after I had booked the job. And then I did have a moment where I turned to my husband and I was like, oh, God, I hope he lets me bring me. I hope he lets me be me. But nothing up to that point in the audition process had led me, had given me any indication that he wouldn't. So I think that was just my own kind of actor paranoia. Um, and the second I got off the train and James saw me, quote unquote, I think, I forget what the actual quote was, but he was kind of like, oh, good. Like, <laughs> it's you, you're perfect. Because, um, you know, keep in mind that all of this was mid-COVID and everything was in these little, you know, Brady Bunch boxes like we're doing right now. Um, and had never seen me from the collarbones down. So who knows what you're going to get. But, um, uh, and then, you know, to work with Mary Beth and Gregory, um, again, maybe naively, um, I shoved all of that very far back into my, uh, into my uh, brain. And was just constantly inspired more than anything. And I will add Alberto to the mix too. And then of course, James and Kimberly as well. And there's nothing like playing tennis with amazing tennis players. You yeah. just are better. And I knew if anything, um, uh, the circumstances just inspired me to, to hopefully be the best I could be every day and then you just trust in the people seeing it that um, it's good enough. Um, uh, but I will again speak to the experience. The whole thing was magical. And in a weird way, you just had to kind of trust the magic of it. Uh, it, it all it was happening very specifically again for a reason. And um, there was so much beauty in that, that if I or all of us just kind of got out of the way of that, uh, it was gonna work. It was going to work. And that's what my experience was. It just wanted to be beautiful. And hopefully mm -hmm. people think that it is because I do. So do I. I love the analogy of the tennis match because maybe not every film is or you uh, feel that you witness that. But I think anybody watching this will absolutely feel that. I think the the reason, or part of the reason, is because of the way we rehearsed. Yeah. We rehearsed it as a play, so we were in the moment, going moment to moment, just as you would in a play. So we really have we're having the fulfilling experience of a the tennis match, as opposed to just scenes, um, cut, you mm -hmm. know, cut away. Um, we experienced it eight hours a day, rehearsing it in real time and in the set. The house that we were what working in was the set, and we were the family. So it it had a, it had an added element of live aliveness for all mm -hmm. of us during the weeks of of rehearsal. So that when the cameras came. We just kept on doing what we'd been doing. We didn't make any adjustments. The cameras kind of had to dance with us, which was so unusual, at least in my experience. I want to add to 
uh, based on my limited film experience, there is something about the quality of James Walsh's generosity as well that yeah. I found really kind of rare and spectacular. Mm -hmm. And from the get, uh, we were critical to telling his story, a story that he had lived. Um, so I found that kind of rare. He knew how this story played out, <laughs> but still in his heart and in his mind, he was willing to, to let the four of us tell yeah. this story and how this story played out, which probably ends up being very different from what literally happened. But there was something about the generosity of everybody there um, that really kind of supported um, a oneness in the experience. I love that. Kimberly, this is your second film with James as executive producer. Tell me what brought you two together and what was the hardest part of uh, shooting Jimmy and Carolyn? Um, and you together? You can be George honest, Austin. Kimberly. Be very honest. <laughs> yeah. uh -oh. Well, no. Just um, with this beautiful bear from London. <laughs> I know. James bought me a bear while he was in London. I collect Herod's bears. So he went to Herod's and braved the crowds for me. Um, James and I have known each other for 21 years this year. Know that. We met on the national tour of Ragtime. Um, he was uh, Tata and I was Emma Goldman. And we traveled the country and went to... New Orleans and some really fun places together, which we'll never talk about in public. But <laughs> he uh, approached me during, we had uh, kind of uh, gotten away from each other and I happened to run into him uh, when he had the first production of Jimmy and Carolyn in New York at uh, a rehearsal studio. Um, and uh, he contacted me three years ago at the beginning of the pandemic. And he said, I want to make a movie and I want you to executive produce. And I was like, I, you're nuts. You're, I, I don't know what to do. And he was like, we'll do it. And to his credit, we did. And it was uh, very successful and we're super happy with it. And then he turned around and just when I thought I was going to get to elect, he said, now we're going to do Jimmy and Carolyn. And I went, Oh, <laughs> um, and honestly, the hardest part about producing uh, Jimmy and Carolyn had nothing to do with any of the people on this screen. No. Like I would literally do anything for any or with any of them ever. They're the most generous, wonderful, prepared, lovely um, people I've ever worked with. And um, I would say that, you know, um, leadership has, you know, what is it? It it starts at the head, so that the comes. With, uh, yeah, so that's Gregory and Mary Beth and James were, you know, it, it was just a wonderful experience. The hardest part was the our last shooting morning when we had um, a power outage in the neighborhood and had no lights and that no way to get a it. Problem. <laughs> Right. And so James goes, I rented a generator. Go pick it up at Lowe's. And I got there and Jeez. the guy was like, do you have a forklift? And I was like, I got it. I got it. And he was like, um, lady, 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 you ain't got it. <laughs> so that was the hardest. Um, was, but, but I think it kind of opened up a creative window and the way that James uh, decided to shoot the last of the, the, yeah. movie it kind of removed some of the noise and um turned out really beautifully so yeah i love good. that speaking of the way james shot the film there's an incredible bye mary beth thank you so much bye, for being mary here oh love y'all bye holidays i'm bye. gonna have to i'm gonna have to drop bye. out too they're calling but mary beth before you go i don't i, I i'm um oh, she's gone oh, she's gone <laughs> Um, you know, I, I wish I could have been in Winston-Salem because that, that, that is a wonderful film festival. I've been there before with another film. Um, I don't understand how Mary Beth could win Best Supporting Actress because she was far from being a supporting actress in this movie. She was, she was, uh, she set the high bar for all the rest of us to follow. So I don't recall if there were lead. No, there weren't. I don't, I don't think there were leads. Um, ah, okay. If I, if. I, yeah, I don't recall, but it was, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. 
Well, then that explains it. But she, <laughs> she was she was fabulous to work with, as was everyone here on the screen. Alberto, wonderful actor, and also makes a great cup of coffee with a lot. Of <laughs> <laughs> well, Gregory, you are incredible in the film. Thank, Thank you for you. being here. Love you, Gregory. <laughs> My pleasure. Love you guys. Love you. Happy holidays. Bye, Bye, Gregory. Have a nice holiday, man. Yeah. Bye, so, James. James of the you know Mark and Alberto of the way this was filmed. Um, there's an incredible scene uh, after dinner at the restaurant. In Mark and Alberto, if you want to talk about the way James shot that and the experience of uh, doing that, take it away. My more articulate other half. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> well, it's funny because there's we had we had actually taped out. Uh, James was so smart, and in the place that we were all staying at, there was this huge room, and we had literally taped out um, how how we were going to shoot it. And so we had rehearsed it and we had rehearsed it. And um, I know Gregory was, would also back me up on this when, and, and James was like, oh my God, I, I want to get this all in one shot, but maybe I should set it up in a way that maybe if something happens, we, we can cut away or whatever. And I remember Gregory was telling him, and James, you'll have to say this. He's like, no, you shoot it the way you want it. We'll do it. He like encouraged you to, to not sacrifice your vision that's right. Um, so on one hand, it was it was it was beautiful, but on the other hand, all those actors are going. We got to get this. How many how many pages was it, James? It was like fourteen pages. Wow. Yeah, it's a very long Docking. scene. Docking. Yeah. Docking. Yeah, it's a very long pages. scene. Go ahead, James. Sorry. I'm so sorry. Someone has just shown up here at my house to help me. So <laughs> I'm actually. I'm, <laughs> I'm so sorry. Well, no, that's okay. <laughs> So it was 14 pages and it's all one shot and it's just completely circular, constantly going around us. So we had all these little taped marks of like little numbers and we rehearsed it and we rehearsed it and we rehearsed it. Um, and then, I don't know, and then um, I went to hand over to Kimberly because Kimberly was behind what was watching. And I remember we had done it, we had done the first take. And Kimberly, what did you, what did, what, what did you find when we, after we had done that first take? After we did the first take, we had the whole night scheduled for just that uh, location. We did the first take and I was like, well, we got that. I don't, do we, should we do it again? Is that it? I mean, it was like actors on stage. It was like curtain up, go. We were finished. And James was like, we should do a couple more just cause I mean, we're all here. You know, we were like scheduled to stay till like midnight and it was like seven o'clock. And he was like, well, let's just do a couple more just because. But I mean, yeah. And you, you know, know what's, what's so interesting? What's, what's, sorry, Mark. You know what's so sorry, Mark. You know what's so interesting is that when actors can feel a victory like that, because the actors don't see what we get in the can. They never really. They don't see it. But when they feel that sense of victory, and we put that that shot was I think the second or third day. It was it was not early, but it was early ish. When they feel that sense of victory, that's a wonderful thing. I'm gonna cry. I don't know why I get so emotional talking about these four actors, but. To give an actor a sense of victory like that, I'm telling you, is is the greatest gift because the actors, they, they blindly go on with this. They don't see what we see until it's all done, right? But to be able to give them that victory and, and to have them feel like they <clears throat> respect and trust you that, yeah, take that victory because we got it. Is an, It's one of the essentials to filmmaking, I think. It really is. It's an essential. But... We, we shot it a few times, Kimberly, and then we we were done. And, yeah, and finished. So I don't know, Mark, wait, I'm sorry I interrupted you, but I-, I No, 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 no. Uh, I was just gonna say, I think, and it's come up several times, Alan, in, or, or subliminally in this conversation. I, I think one of the things that happened that ex was extraordinary from my perspective anyway, is at the core, you have um, th all, all of these theater babies who came together to make this movie. Uh, Gregory, Mary Beth, Alberto, James, Kimberly, me, everyone. Uh, and there's something for me, oddly, it was, it was so natural because I kept feeling like we were rehearsing a play and, and the cameras mm -hmm. just happened to be there. And yeah. that's the expertise of James and our DPs and everyone beyond that. But we never had to worry about that. It never seemed to me like the process was actually, again, maybe naively at third time I'm using the word, about that. I almost forgot that we were shooting a movie. And I, I think, and then you just put all that trust and faith in James 
and and I think that's also what made it um, uh, beautifully un, uh, unselfconscious and natural mm. and, and 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 alive. Um, because you know, in theater, you play for the live moment, right? Mm -hmm. You don't play to be edited. You don't play to be lit and relit. You don't play for camera angles. Um, and that's and that's why uh, it again is so rare. Sorry, I babbled a little. That, bit. That's quite all right. We, we've got about a minute, but James, you talk about that the actors don't get to see. Um, and we talked about that all four of these actors were playing people very near and dear to you. Um, what was that like every day? Watching, listening to your story unfold yeah. from these well, four talented well, people. <laughs> Well, that's interesting question because once you write something like that, wow. Well, that, that was Alberto's, something was going on, I think, with his sound. Once you've written the movie and the process of getting it ready and rehearsing it, by the time the cameras roll, and we did a extensive rewriting with the actors, and by the time the cameras roll, it's a, it's an entirely separate thing. It, it, it really is a, uh, it takes on its own life. So as far as watching Gregory play my dad or watching Mary Beth play my mom or watching uh, Mark play me, at that point, they're not me and my mother and my father. They're someone else that's just there. And so there's an objectivity. I will say the one thing was with Alberto and playing my partner because it's a story about how I hurt my partner very badly along the way. And to see that acted out by someone I didn't, you know, it really, that really hit me. And um, I think Alberto did an incredible job with that. Um, um, and, 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 or self-pitying. And, you know, that was hard. That was the hardest thing. But the rest of it, because Alberto allowed me to see, give voice and emotion to something that, you know, I hadn't really experienced until he, he, he showed it and both William and I experienced it. And not only did it make for a good movie and a good, a wonderful performance, it made for a, and it, the healing, you know, our relationship healed as a result of that. I love that. Beautiful. So I just want you to know that as far as the, the truth in filmmaking, that, that was really the most impactful thing. Thank you for sharing that. Before I let you go, I t tell everybody, you're working to get this released? Yes, we've been, you know, it's so exciting when distributors come along and they're like, oh, we saw your film and we love it. And then they start talking. It's, yeah. Kimberly, it's very exciting when they start going on and on about, you know, this and that and what they see. And of course, when when it's very gratifying when they see what you wanted them to see. So we're, you know, we're, we're about to sort of finalize a deal. Um, they believe that there might be some sort of a play on Lifetime or Showtime or a network play, a cable play, which would be amazing. Amazing. Uh, given some of the name recognition of Mary Beth and Gregory. So that would be the first part of the strategy, but they're very excited about it. Um, and, you know, hopefully we'll do some kind of limited theatrical release so that we can, you know, qualify for some awards. But yeah, that, that's, all, that's all in the works. Yes. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being here and, and sharing uh, your stories with us. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. It's great Thank to see you. Thank you. Again. Well, happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. everybody. Love you're, all. One of the, you're one of the good guys, Alan. You really Thank are. You. You're one of the good guys. Yeah, you really, really are. Bye, everybody. Have a nice Christmas, everybody. Love to all. Bye. Love you all. Happy holidays. Bye, Bye everybody. Oh, Juan, I'll be right there. <laughs> oh, Jimmy and Carolyn, stay tuned for that. Our next guest, Unidentified Objects, won the Jury Award for Best Narrative Feature, and Matthew August Jeffers won the Jury Award for Best Performance in a Leading Role. Matthew as Peter is a flamboyant, misanthropic dwarf hiding from the world in his shabby New York apartment. But an unexpected visit from his upbeat and possibly unhinged neighbor, neighbor Winona, forces him out of his shell and into an impromptu road trip. Their destination? what she believes to be the site of an upcoming alien visitation in the wilderness of rural Canada. On their increasingly surreal odyssey, Peter and Winona will encounter bickering lesbian cosplayers, 
shroom addled survivalists, and even extraterrestrial cops along the way. Please welcome writer director Juan Felipe Zuleta and Matthew August Jeffers. Oop. Hi. Sorry, everybody. There we go. Hello, everybody. Thanks so much. I, I'm glad you got home, Matthew. Yeah, thanks. Me too. Congratulations hey. to you both on, on your awards. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. I appreciate it. You're Thank so, you so welcome. Much. Thank you for having I, us. I, as one of the jurors, I really enjoyed your film and your performance. <laughs> um, Juan, you and your writing partner, Leland Frankel, wrote this film. Can you tell me where the idea for this story came from? So, actually, we, 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 Leland and I have been uh, working together for seven years now. And, and we, were, we have a lot of projects that we're constantly developing. And, and before COVID, we did have like something that came from more of like academic, uh, academia us, like filmmakers who are also like, who love to like to study film. And we had like this character study of a little person. Uh, and we both also kind of like, like genre bending uh, uh, stories, stories that are not quite like, like just sci-fi or, 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 or but that are like, like bending everything together, blending everything together. So we had this idea of like a character study of a little person and, and, and we just found it very fascinating and, and like, just like, like seeing like how, like that, that, that world. And we had done a lot of research and we also were very concerned or surprised that there wasn't a lot of movies out there with little people leads. And, and just that, that, that alone was just something that we were curious on when COVID hit, like, and we found ourselves in our apartments and we were like, basically like, nothing to do i was in new york Lilian was in la we were both unemployed we were both like dealing with a lot of a lot of a lot of problems uh as most people in the world uh we we kind of like this idea like came to us and we started writing a 30 like a 30 page treatment we started just going at it and and like it, it, the, the thing about the alien abduction is that is is or the alien abduction theme is a story of escapism, of trying to leave your world, of trying not to confront your problems, or trying to leave your reality. And that alone is something that I feel all of us felt at some point uh, during COVID. So, so kind of like that clicked. And in a matter of, of a couple of weeks, uh, and by the way, I, I just gotta say, like Leland is a brilliant playwright and a, like a masterful like a, a screenwriter. And, and in many ways, I think he is like a lot of the. I gotta give all, a lot of the credit for. Like the the character dialogues and all of that in terms of of story structure and story beats and scenes and developing in creativity is both of us going back and forth like th throwing ideas at each other and trying to see what that is. But but like I feel this one in particular is one of those scripts that once we had the idea and once we found the fa the character of Winona and we combined it with this like little person character study, it was a matter of weeks where we had like the first draft. And then after that, since then, the first person we brought on board was Matthew. Uh, after like started diving into like casting, and and then Matthew gave a, did a pass with us. Matthew came in as an actor and as a producer as well, because for us it was ma like massively important that it felt like a collaboration. This is a story that that had to be told like with the perspective of a little person uh, in mind, and like and also like uh, in in the process, uh, I think we just all pour our hearts into it. But that's kind of more, more or less how it happened. I love that. Matthew, talk about being approached or reading, you know, the first draft of this for the first time and your initial thoughts. Um, well, like, like Juan Fei uh, introduced, right? This came on, this, this, this came, this project came to be, uh, the germ of it came to be in the crux of, of COVID, you know, June, May, June, 2020. Um, and so obviously I was dealing with my own trauma, fami familial trauma and, and just the trauma at large. And, and um, I, I remember my agent approached me, emailed me and said, you know, you have this um, audition that came through. And I, I thought it was a, uh, I thought it was like a student film, it, it, like the, the, the description and the vibe, uh, which yeah, there's nothing wrong with student film, but <laughs> it was, I was, you know, we all have to start somewhere, as Juan we all did. Start somewhere. <laughs> we all have to start somewhere. Um, but uh, it can. I don't know if I ever told you that Juan Fei, but it, it gave it gave. You did. Me, you did. You did. I, I was like, this is NYU short film, um, but um, but no, I you know I I I, uh, I think it took what Juan Fei like two weeks for a week and a half for me to agree to audition, and I did. My my partner at the time. Uh, convinced me to and put myself on tape and I think a couple of days later you know they asked for a callback and 
and I had a call back with Juan Fei and Leland and Juan Se, the producer, main producer, and it was you know, 45 minutes. And that's when I knew that A, I was dealing with a bunch of very young people. <laughs> um, and But most importantly, I was dealing with people who were clearly very driven and very, very talented. Um, and, you know, we, we read, we read one of the main scenes in that callback, but more importantly, there was just the chemistry that we, you know, it was just a back and forth of what Leland's vision was, what Juan Fei's vision was for what this film was, was going to be. Cause like Juan Fei said, it, it, it was kind of an express lane um, process. And so it mm-hmm. all came together rapidly and how I would fit into that world. And like Juan Fei said, you know, they were explicit from the get go that this was to be a collaboration uh, of story and that their main approach to this was creating an authentic lens of the little person uh, experience that is um, not not seen um, enough. Overlooked. Overlooked. No pun intended. Um, But yes, overlooked. (laughs) Overlooked. Sorry. Very, <laughs> very much overlooked. And um, and so uh, I got the offer a couple of days later and, and you know, I, I had never done film. I mainly done theater and TV up until that point. And this was to be my first feature. It certainly supposed to, was going to be my first leading role. And I was filled with um, self-doubt, like truly crushing self-doubt um, because I, I had no idea. You know, I I was I had a blank canvas in front of me. Right. I, I this it was all new terrain. It was a a new frontier for me. And so I called a couple of dear mentors that I have, uh, that I have accumulated in my life and started to break the character down. And a couple of days later, I read the script for the first time. And, and, you know, Juan Fei knows, like, I didn't sleep that night. It was, um, it felt like a transcendent experience that I was, it was as if, um, you know, it was as if I had dreamed up a script and I was reading it. Right. It was like wow. this, this, this script that I had that I could only dream of that was now from Leland and Juan Fei on paper. And it was mine. Right. I didn't have to worry about, oh, I have to go get this role. It was already mine. And so um, it was great. That was kind of the that was the process of how it came to be. And then like a week later, we were in Maine shooting. It's crazy. Wow. Um, talk about both of you, you know, um, Juan Felipe, you said you wanted to have a collaboration so that you told this authentically and, and both of you, you know, share, but you know, um, how did Matthew help bring that authenticity besides himself into the so, script? So I think there's, I would say two, two main ways and Matthew, you can add to this. Yeah. The first one is allowing, uh, giving us permission to say certain things that are like the way the world works. Like it, obviously when you're talking about certain people who, it's not like if, if like I'm obviously Leland and I were not like little people, but but we we did a lot of research and we were thinking about it and and then like showing him our work and being completely open and being like please tear it apart, give us feedback, like opening up and being like like uh, and then Matthew actually what he did was that, like for example in the, the script when they say the word midget, he was like yeah like put that there like and like and like this is how it is and and he was basically like allowing us to like, and like giving us permission to like the bar scene, no, that this is where the, the, the pain should come from, the gas station scene, this is kind of how it is. And 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 throughout, I mean, that, that's kind of like the stories about aliens, about people who don't belong, about outsiders, about and like a little person, like it, it fits in mm-hmm. there very beautifully as a metaphor. And there's a scene in there. So, so it's kind of like making sure that we were all in the same page and we were all understood what we wanted to tell. And, and why our hearts and why we needed to make this story. So so it kind of like a lot of it was obviously like from script script screen screen writing sense, but also or like it's like giving us permission, but also from like a thematic standpoint of like this is why we're telling this story and and making sure that it also felt incredibly personal to him and that we Matthew was heard in terms of uh, and he had a voice amongst us when it came to decision making and, and actually which is a very uncommon process, but I showed Matthew rough cuts of the movie as well. I just wanted, I, for me, it was incredibly important that he, he could tell me what he thought. And, yeah. and, 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 and actually Matthew for a while didn't see it. He just showed it to his family members. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's kind of like- You didn't, you didn't want to look at it? 
Yeah, I, I don't. I, I struggle watching my. I mean, that's a common thing. I, I struggle watch watching myself. And um, I remember I was actually on set. I was shooting a little guest spot for FBI on CBS. And I remember I was standing. It was freezing outside. It was snowing, and I was staring at the skyline um, from Brooklyn on set. And I was on the phone with Juan Fe. It was February 2021, and he said. Matthew, I love you. I respect you, but you have to watch a cut of this film. You have to, you have to watch it. And, um, and I went home that night and I watched it. It was a very, very early cut. Um, um, and yeah, like, like Juan Fe said, it, this was a all very highly unusual story of how it came to be. I mean, all of it, like at every stop along the way, um, very unorthodox um, in terms of my involvement, um, uh, you know, Juan Fe, Fe and I are working on, and Leland are working on a new uh, TV series. And just, we, you know, we've had a couple of talks this week and, you know, recounting on it, you know, Juan Fe was like, you know, I'm, I wasn't, I'm not qualified to, to make a feature film. I'm not qualified to make unidentified objects. Like nothing about this process was on paper. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but what we had was incredibly talented people, top top to bottom and we had a vision and we had drive all of us um and that's really like like one fave will always say that's that's what you need more than anything else and so um i did i did come on i did watch early script early cuts and i'm glad i did because i at that time had already developed a, a really intense working relationship with Juan fey so i could feel really comfortable about saying no, I don't agree with this edit, right? Or I really feel strongly about, I mean, I, I in no way, you know, edited the film, but I did have say, right? There, 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 there are parts of the story that I wanted it to look this way. And because Wan Fei trusted me and I trusted Wan Fei, you know, we, that, there was a collaboration there, right? A, a give and take, so to speak. And, and um, it worked out pretty beautifully. I love that. Um you, you have both have won a number of awards. The film, um, talk about, you know, what, what that feels like, you know, Matthew, especially, you know, I think you expressed, you were hesitant to take this, this part and, you know, how does it feel today? <laughs> One thing. <laughs> no, Matthew, please go ahead. <laughs> it feels great. Um, you know, this was a, it was a journey. This whole thing was a journey. It was a great, uh, it was a great year of festivals. We've had, we had some really, really wonderful experiences. Um, you know, recognition is always great, but I will leave this year thinking about all of the, the people that, that I met at these festivals, the passion, right, that, that these artists have for telling stories, for pushing the boundaries of, of what people are, are watching on screen. It's just been a very fulfilling experience for me. Um, Wanfe has a little more experience in the film circuit than I do uh, from previous uh, pro projects that he's done. <clears throat> so this was all very new for me. Um, there was a full circle moment for me personally that I'll say, and then I'll give it to Wanfe. We, we, we had a, a private screening of Unidentified Objects last August, August 2021 in LA. And um, it was just for family and friends. It was like the second screening that we had done. We were still submitting to a lot of festivals for 2022. And there was a woman who came up to me afterward and she was like, oh my God, this would have been so perfect for Outfest. It just ended. And I was like, oh, okay, like Outfest next year, Outfest. You know? And so I told Juan Fe, you know, let's put Outfest on our, on our bullseye. And, um, and we won, you know, we ended up, we ended up going to Outfest and we, we did, wonderfully at Outfest. Um, we, we, so that was a beautiful full, full circle moment a year later. Um, hopefully, you know, our journeys, one Fay will go into it later, but, but uh, our journey is, is in many ways just beginning with this film, uh, with, with just uh, acquiring distribution and having a, a release later next year, which we're all very excited about and um, <clears throat> seeing how we can continue to uh, um, reach a, a wider audience. One Fay. Do you yes. want to talk about getting the film released and 
Yeah, yeah, I can definitely talk a little. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, I feel film festivals have been a blessing, and I think I think that's the most important thing I can say to any. I'm a I'm a, a very young filmmaker, and this is my first feature film, and I have so many projects that I want to make and continue working with people like Matthew and with Matthew himself. I, I he's one of we share birthdays, by the way. We, 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 oh, wow. our, uh, he's, he's, he's really become a, a he's one of my best friends. You know, it's, it's not just a collaborator, but someone that I trust professionally and personally it's it's i, I can't Thanks. even i can't i can't even express you know how, how special you know, as much as we talk about what covid um yes brought on it brought on some really yes yes 100 percent. and 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 i think obviously any award we've won um i i think awards ultimately it does come to like like it does help I, I, unfortunately unfortunately like a movie like ours <laughs> comes from nowhere like i don't have a, as i as i would said earlier we don't have any like resume that can say and most film first time directors don't have like they ha you have to will it to success you have to like prove to the world that you can actually sh do something so it's been a, a long process of like like a lot of a lot of hours of and days and and years at this point of a lot of hard work so when you go and you play the movie in a theater and or to an audience and people respond to it that's the most rewarding thing in the world. That's ultimately more than anything. That's ultimately why you tell stories is because you want to connect. You have something to say. And, and I think if anything, the awards, I mean, first of all, just getting into a festival in the first place is like a major, major accomplishment. And I feel we're very proud because the quality out there is really high. Like there's a lot of really great movies and, and there is a lot of uh, great, really great movies that didn't get into Outfest or didn't get into Sundance or didn't get into, and like, and like mm -hmm. they're like trying to find a home. So in many ways, film festivals, uh, I feel have become a little bit of our home as first time filmmakers, as, a, as, a, you know, as an immigrant in the United States. And so having this and, and you giving us your time and, and sharing your platform, it's just, it means so much to us. And, and we're incredibly uh, thankful for everything. And now when it comes to distribution, we uh, fortunately enough, unidentified objects did get a few options of, of for potential distributors. We were we were in the process of uh, locking one uh, this week. Actually, like we're we're right now signing like term sheets, and hopefully oh, awesome. uh, the in the next couple of weeks we'll we'll finish locking down the long form agreement. It will have it will have a, a limited theatrical release. Um, which we're super stoked about because obviously as a filmmaker, you know, in the streaming era, that's it. That's some, that means something and that and mm -hmm. we're very proud of, which by the way, we'll reach out to you eventually. And be I like, was Yo. just going to say that, yeah. get Sarah together and Leland together and we'll, we'll all come back. I would sounds love good. That. Sounds good. I, I, that sounds like it's going to happen for sure. And we'll let you know. Okay. And thank you. But well, besides, yeah. Yeah. No, no. Besides that, it's been uh, yeah, it's kind of like, seeing how we can, for me, as, as like, I, and Matthew, once I met Matthew and I realized we were making this and we were like all in it, it kind of became like a personal goal to me to just go as far as I can possibly go with the movie. Like, I'm, I'm like, so it's kind of like, it, like sometimes as a director, you don't have to put that much work necessarily to push your first film because oh, you, you, people start focusing on their second or third and other mm -hmm. options. Like, how do you make a living? How do you create more opportunities? But for me, Unidentified Objects is still as a priority just because I feel the story is so, so, so important and so many people have to see it. And, and so obviously I'm working in other things, but, but this is still like my to do list on 2023. I'm like, I'm not, I just need to make sure this gets to an audience and, and that we can like explore it as much, like, like throw, put it out there as much as we can. Well, best of luck in that. Thank you both so much for spending the time. Happy holidays to you both and uh, stay in touch. Thank you so much, Alan. You're so it. welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Keep your eyes out for unidentified objects, everyone. Up next in this film, a gay cis woman's father is surprisingly happy when she, tr sorry, when she rings her trans mask boy, brings her trans mask boyfriend home, but she soon realizes he's only happy because she's in a straight passing relationship. This film boyfriend won the award for best narrative short and joining us today to tell us now, about the film are the film's co-writers and directors, Rebecca Marquardt and Lane Michael Stanley. Did I pronounce your last name right, Rebecca? Pretty, pretty close, Marquardt. Marquardt. 
Thank you. But I'll take both. Mark Hart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both so much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us. You are so welcome. Please tell me how you both came together uh, on this project and first how you both first met. Uh, we met through this project. Um, so my uh, my cat woke me up in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> apologies, there's a phone ringing uh -oh. in the room over. Um, my cat woke me up in the middle of the night. I was trying to go back to sleep and I found myself thinking, if I, if I dated somebody non-binary, could I still call myself gay? And I was like, oh, that's like, there's there's like meat to that question. You know, like it, it just depends on the relationship and the situation. But um but I was like, that could be great for a short film. And I knew that I really, I feel like I'm getting darker. I really, I knew I really wanted to make a short film. Um, and I needed some collaborators. And so I was living in Austin, Texas at the time and um, got online and tried to find a local playwright in Austin, somebody who was non-binary. And I came across a play that Lane had done there called Transom. And I think it was like the whole cast and creative team was trans and or non-binary, like in the trans non-binary world. Um, and I found their website and I just sent a cold email and just said like, here's a little bit about who I am. This is a project I wanna make. Can we just meet on Zoom? If you're excited about this and we feel like a good fit, maybe we write something together. If it doesn't feel like a good fit, maybe you can point me toward an actor who could be a collaborative part of that writing process. Um, and we got along great. We had a lovely call on Zoom and Lane joined on to co-write and then that grew into co-directing and co-producing. Um, and yeah, it's all sunshine and roses ever since. <laughs> Lane, talk about getting that message. Uh, sure, yeah. So, I mean, I, uh, you know, Re Rebecca didn't, I was very open, I think, with where this idea could go. And and kind of as she just explained, it was really just about kind of this intersection of like how uh, how how might trans identity, you know, and non-binary identity kind of trouble um, the concept of like monosexuality generally, right? Um, and so, yeah, that I'm I'm down to get on a Zoom and talk about that. <laughs> um, and and things just kind of grew from there. Wow, what was the hardest part of fleshing the story? You know, making it short, fleshing the story out, and getting everything in that you wanted to articulate to the audience. I think we found an angle. So, so we reached out to actors that we were interested in before we completely developed the story. So the actors who played Kel and Gabriella, uh, their names are Adrian and, um, oh no. Tatiana. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. It's um, hard when you get their character names in your head and then you're like, Gabriella. Okay, yes, no, that's there. not, that's not her real name. <laughs> yeah. um, so we brought the two of them on and we were, we were talking about these concepts and, um, you know, I think that we were a little less interested in the concept of like the cis partner, you know, we've seen too many times, right? Like the cis partner who uh, their partner transitions and then they have like a total meltdown of like, but now who am I? You know, so we we weren't super interested in the cis partner, like being really threatened by dating a trans person. Like we don't really have enough models. I think because that's such a common trope, we don't have a lot of models of like people dating trans people and they're fine about it. And they don't have a huge complex about it, um, you know. And so it was important, I think, that it not come from her, that, like, within the relationship, they were like, cool, one of us is trans and one of us isn't, and that's not, like, uh, that doesn't have to be a lot of strife. And so through those conversations, we kind of got into the idea of this dad character um, who, you know, and, and, and ideas also about, like, if they're straight, if they're a straight passing relationship, um, there is a kind of, there's a, like passing is very complicated because obviously like it brings privilege in certain ways, but it also bring, it can feel like it's bringing a separation from your community or a way that you're just not fully being seen in the depths of who you are. Right. And so it's, it's a complicated, it's a complicated thing. And so bringing in the dad character um, and, and really positioning the conflict around that allowed us to kind of keep our values around like protecting that relationship, right? And having trans characters who are just like loved and accepted by people who don't have to struggle to do that, which is something, but you need conflict in a movie, right? So that that's the, um, uh, those are some of the things that we were, were juggling and working toward. Did you always that's, set out I think, to, oh yeah, continue, go Rebecca. 
No, please. Uh, no, I was just going to say like the whole process was very, very collaborative. So like in the beginning, I think we had this idea of like, okay, the, the conflict is in being like straight passing and how do they react to being straight passing? And we had a different context for where they were perceived as straight. And then when we brought the actors in, we just had a conversation. I think it was like two hours of just conversation about identity, about what does it mean when you are seen as straight cis because all four of us, the us two writers and the two actors that we brought on are frequently perceived as straight or cis. Um, and so we just had a, a conversation about where it's like, yeah, sometimes actually it's good because you're in an environment where you're not entirely sure if you're safe. And so you're like, whew, okay, great. They don't know, it's my little secret. Um, but then there are other environments where you're like, no, no, you can't, like this isn't, you know. Um, but then we had them improvise as if they were a couple and we just said, great, what was your first date like? Or how did you meet for the first time? And one of the questions we asked was, when did you know that it was a real, like a meaningful, serious relationship? And both of them said that it was when Adrian met Tatiana's father. And so we were like trying to find the context of when they passed as straight. And then I was like, oh my gosh, I have this like stunning location. We could make it the dad's house and then we could shoot there. Um, and Lane was like, send me pictures at this location. And I sent a few pictures and Lane was like, yes, we have the story then. Like, it's just kind of like, great. Like a nice cinematic opportunity and the stakes are like higher by making it a family member and not just like some random people who are like, oh, look, a straight couple, you know, yeah. Did you always set out to do it as a short? <laughs> yes. Yep. Okay. Short answer. Yeah. <laughs> short answer for the short. I love that. Next. <laughs> Lane, you are transgender yourself and co-founder of Secretly Famous Productions. Can you tell me the message with your production company, what you're trying to? Sure. Yeah. So my production company uh, is me and my producing partner, Lowell Blank. Um, we collaborated at collaborated on my first feature, uh, which is called Addict Named Hal, that's currently streaming on Amazon, iTunes, wherever you would want to stream something. Um, and we basically, our, our primary miss mission is uh, character-driven stories from the margins. And for me, that ends up falling into two main umbrellas. One is recovery and restorative justice. I have about six and a half years sober, and so a lot of work comes out. Congratulations. Of Thank you. Um, and and the other umbrella is, is queer and trans storytelling. Um, and sometimes they get to intersect. <laughs> there are queer <laughs> people in recovery besides me. Um, you know, but but it can feel a little bit like a like a Venn diagram. So Addict Named Hal is uh, very much inspired, but it's a fiction film, but it's inspired by my experiences uh, living in a recovery house for six months when I first got sober um, after my fiance died very suddenly. And um, we're now working on our second narrative feature, which is called T, which we're shooting incrementally over the lead actor's first year on testosterone. So that it's kind of, it's a, also a fiction film, but we're saying it's like boyhood for gender transition. Uh, so you get to see, you know, how their body is changing through this fictionalized story. Um, and uh, yeah, we have uh, always always a slate of projects. I just closed down the Avid on um, the documentary project uh, to hop into the Zoom. I guess it's not Zoom, but whatever. Yeah, we, we close see. enough. Uh, <laughs> can people watch Boyfriend Online or will will they be able to soon? Eventually. We, um, Winston-Salem Out of the Movies was our premiere film festival. So that's like the start. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. That's the start of not our festival bad. year. So a, probably. Uh, your premiere film festival. <laughs> I mean, and like the whole experience that whole weekend was just like, this is incredible. And I was like, Lane, is this how film festivals always are? And Lane was like, no, <laughs> I'm ruined. I'm ruined. I mean, we went to like the opening night party and then we were like, we're going to walk back to the hotel. And it was raining. And Rex, the festival director was like, no, 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 please let me put my drink down. I'll drive you back. And we're like, you know, it's like two blocks away. And he's like, it's raining. It's, I, come, I, I got you. I got you. You know, I was like, wow, Rex, does the festival director Rex always show for you? <laughs> Yeah, Rex, Rex yeah. is the best. Well, that's why James uh, Walsh from Jimmy and Carolyn, mm -hmm. I had mentioned uh, at the beginning of the show, when I got in the car, we shared the car from the airport. He said that uh, out at the movies film festival was his favorite festival. Yeah, so it's I'm sure it has a lot to, to answer, do with Rex. Yeah, for sure. I, his whole heart is in it. I mean, he yeah. just is passionate about trying to bring queer movies to Winston-Salem. And it's uh, like, that's 
that's the perfect reason to start a festival like that. <laughs> well, absolutely. Well, we will all keep our eyes peeled for Boyfriend. But Rebecca, before I let you go, your covers of music have over 2 million views online. <laughs> to a two-part sure. question. What prompted you to start doing covers? And what's your favorite cover that you've done? Ooh. Um, <laughs> weirdly, my my instinct of what my favorite one is actually the song Boyfriend by Justin Bieber, because I just, I was like really into that song at the time and it was, it didn't fit a looper. So I use an acap a looper, like where you like go, and then it just repeats that over and over again. And it didn't really fit on a looper. So I had to get really creative. And so when I finally finished it, like I was so proud that I made it work. Um, covers, I've I've always loved covers. I studied music in college and grad school. And my goal was always just to like have something that I could sing along with. And then I saw uh, the comedian Reggie Watts was opening for Conan O'Brien years ago. Um, he does the music for James Corden, or at least did for a while. Oh. But he uses a looper and he improvises stuff. And then he does comedy on top of it. And I was like, I want that thing, but I want to do covers on it. And like, I got an app and it took years before I actually like figured out how to use the app. But yeah, once I got it, I was just like, this is so ridiculous and goofy and weird and aggressively me. So I was like, I have to do it. <laughs> I, I love that. And it works. People are watching. It's People fun. Watching. It's fun. <laughs> well, congratulations to you both. Thank you so much for being here. And uh, people, please keep your eyes peeled for Boyfriend. Thank you Woo. both. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. You're so welcome. All right. Up next, joining me right now is Jacopo Costantini, who stars in the Italian submission, The Neighbor, that had its world premiere at the festival. The Neighbor is an intense love story between two young men um, that forms from a harrowing incident they are involved in. From that moment on, nothing will be like it used to be. And the love between the two men sadly brings to light Luca's parents' hate and intolerance toward, towards their relationship. Please welcome Jacopo Costantini to the locker room. Oh, hello there. Hi. Ciao. <laughs> Ciao. <laughs> nice to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> you are so welcome. Are you outside in New York right now? So actually, uh, I'm I'm an, an actor in New York. So of course, I, I work in a restaurant, and this is the, the oh. restaurant where I work. And uh, it's a, it's a lovely spot in Brooklyn. Of course, an Italian restaurant, and the owners are my very close friends. So they let me have a part of the restaurant for the. Uh, <laughs> I love that. Well, I, I told you when when we met, you were incredible in the neighbor. Um, I was surprised to learn you are a straight actor playing a gay man. Um, talk about working opposite, uh, am I pronouncing it wrong? Michelle Costubile? Michele, Michele, Michele Costabile. Michele. Talk about working opposite Michele in this project. So I, um, I never met Michele before the first day of set. I, I knew him because... Uh, He's my age and we went to acting school almost at the same time. So I heard of him. He's actually, he works with one of the most important contemporary theater in Milan, which is Teatro dell'Elfo. So I, I heard of him and he came to see, uh, to see me on a show because he knew my, my, my show partner, uh, Julia. And so we, we kind of knew each other but we never met and um, I, I, I really work with Pasquale the director Michele was his first experience with Pasquale and uh, the first day I was like okay Michele you don't know what you're going into <laughs> <laughs> because the work with Pasquale is very peculiar is very actor based so he doesn't really have a script he has a, a vision he has uh, scenes in his head so once he has the setup, he just comes to you and he tells you what he wants on the scene to happen. The camera is always moving so that it's not like a long shot, uh, close up and stuff. So it's always dynamic. You always have to be in the situation, in character. The camera can be like this close to you or can be behind you. And you have to be just in the situation. So... Uh, I think with Michele, we develop a strong alchemy. He's 
straight too. So, and uh, and uh, Pasquale he loves working with with straight actors because he says there's not. Uh, it's very he finds that straight actors who are willing to portray gay men very available, very generous on the mm. on camera, and uh, and for me it was a love story. So. Sometimes, of course, Pasquale told me, think about your partner, your girlfriend. And I, I thought about her and uh, the scene came up. And so it's, it's, it's all fiction, you know, it's true. Yeah, but yeah. It's fiction. Of, of, <laughs> of course. Um, where did the film, did the film shoot in Milan? Yes, actually, Pasquale found, uh, um, we work mostly in this neighborhood called the Quarto Giaro which is a pretty, you know, like a project neighborhoods of, of Milan. And still, I remember shooting one scene, uh, one outdoor scene with people on a bar, like uh, whistling to us because we were like uh, caressing each other. It wasn't not even that explicit, but people there are very, you know, close minded. They're, they're not, it's not, uh, it's Milan's uh, suburbs. Yeah. And, uh, but it has a very, it's right. It's right for that, uh, for that neighborhood. It's right for that. Uh, unfortunately, it's right for this historical moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the really the the environment around us really helped us. Uh, all the scenes uh, that are outdoor feel like they belong to that place. You know what I mean. And uh, also Pasquale this summer work on a, on a, he's working on a trilogy. So the, the, the second title is Hotel Milano. So this summer he shot Hotel Napoli, Hotel Naples. So he shot in Naples. And the third part of the trilogy, this is a little bit of a, of a preview, will probably take place in, uh, in the States. He would like to come and shoot in New York. So, and then is the, the neighbor as part of that trilogy? The neighbors is the first part. It's it's they're not related really. Okay, so that's it's what I was curious about. The, yeah, the relationship it's gonna be a, a gay drama. It's it's because Pasquale loves to work in a drama. Uh, drama is the best uh, uh, cinematic expression he can he can give. He he really works on heavy stuff. He he's Napolitan. He's Napolitan. Grew up in Milan, so he has these two you know very. This very strong uh, and uh, and uh, fiery soul that brings over in the in the camera very well that communicates very well to his actors. So it's cool. <laughs> Interesting. Um, was was there a, a most difficult part of shooting the film for you? Well, of course, the the intimate scene uh, were demanding, but. I would say they were not demanding because they were with a man. Uh, they were demanding because they were very intimate, and right. because that, that he really would be wanted on us. camera, on camera with yeah. male or female is yeah um, yeah yeah. I did. I don't think. I don't think uh, with a female partner, it would have been easier. I feel still we had to find, uh, you know, to break the embarrassment and really portray two lover in uh, in their bedroom which is at least for me is the most intimate moment that i have with my partner when we are just uh, uh, chilling and uh, no mask and no society no no one around and no so, cameras watching and no cameras watching so that yeah. intimate part was very hard and you know from the, the other point of view the the um, the beating scene was also very demanding when i get beat up uh, and I remember the actor who, the bully, the bully who hit me, he was, he was a really um, a box a trainer. So oh, he, wow. So, and, and I remember, and he, he was very young. He was at his first experience. Uh, and I remember while shooting, uh, I was like, okay, let, let's do it. So I, I, I was like, you know, very focused. And uh, after two takes, uh, he asked like five minutes to say, okay, give, give me a second because I'm not doing a good thing, and I want to. I want to keep it, keep it easy. And I told him, "Yeah, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, Andrea." <laughs> I love it. Do you know um, when the film might be released here in the states? So 
the, it's it's still in progress uh, with the distribution. Probably they they wanted to make like a a, a, a physical distribution like a DVD or a Blu-ray, uh, something like that. I, I don't know. I I really hope uh, hope it can be seen um, as mm-hmm. much as possible because I think it's a it's a genuine story, you know. And it's really we are talking about indie indie film. So it, mm-hmm. the the set the crew was like. Uh, me, Michele, Pasquale, the DOP, and Pasquale's assistant, and and it, it, it's an intimate thing, and it's a it's a strong story. So I hope it, it can be seen as much as possible. And I think out at the movies was the perfect perfect uh, environment for for and and I remember during the screening, people crying at the end, and uh, it was uh, it was it was the that's the right right place for for a product like that. I think. Absolutely. What What's next for you? So, uh, hopefully, I haven't signed anything yet, but uh, in March, May, I should be uh, shooting a film in Italy as a, as a co, co-lead. It's a very interesting project, but as I said, I mean, they ask, they, I had the yeah, ability to check, but sign. until I sign, I, I don't say anything. So, <laughs> I absolutely. Hope, uh, I what hope, brought yeah. What brought you to New York City? I am my partner. My, I met my my girlfriend in uh, in my city, Perugia, because she was studying Italian. Uh, she's an opera singer. She used to work at, work at the Met, and uh, it was supposed to be a summer fling. And it's like uh, eight years together, so <laughs> it's going well. That, well, <laughs> that's awesome, Jacopo. So good to see you. Happy holidays, my friend. Thank you, Alan. Buon Natale. <laughs> Hope to see you soon. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao. Thanks everybody for joining us today. Thank you to Rex Welton for bringing everyone together and for inviting me to be a part of Out at the Movies International Film Festival. To learn more about the festival, please visit outatthemovie.org. This is my last show of 2022. I hope you all have a wonderful holiday surrounded by friends and family. If you or anyone you know needs help, please call 988 or visit 988lifeline.org. Let's keep everyone safe this holiday. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you like today's show, click the like button and turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And remember, you can download audio versions just search The Locker Room on your favorite favorite streaming platform. Have a wonderful holiday. Happy and healthy New Year to everyone. And I will see you all in 2023 with some exciting new shows.